It's the end of December. It's that time of the month again, answering Overwatch 2 questions from Reddit. Here we go. Okay, sorted by the top of December 2022. First question is group up voice line inconsistencies. Why did they change the group up communication wheel so that it says different things depending on where you are? When I'm respawning, it says waiting to respawn. When I'm in spawn, it says I'm on my way. And only outside the spawn, it actually says group up. This is really annoying because if we're getting spawn kept or I'm trying to tell my team to group instead of trickling slash staying alive and staggering, it doesn't work as intended, especially the on my way one because then they're like, oh good, we should keep stalling till he gets here. Also often on attack, the best place to group up in low ranks is in the spawn to avoid people getting randomly killed because they stuck their head out around a corner. But in order to stay grouped up, I have to go out of spawn. It's counterintuitive. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't want to type it out. Okay. So the group up voice line is part of the new ping system in Overwatch 2. The group up fires what we call a contextual communication ping. As annoying as it is, there is a way to sort of bypass that. As far as I know, you can change your ping sensitivity in order to pop open what we call a ping wheel. So if you hold that button down, I rebound the middle mouse button because I'm used to Apex. Warzone players might use the alt button. And I think on console, it's one of the D-pad, maybe right D-pad. You can actually change and use another voice line there or ping that's similar to group up. You can also respond to people's pings. If somebody pings something, you can actually click their ping, hold the button, and a whole wheel of responses comes out. This is useful if you don't want to use your voice. Grouping up and saying grouping up like verbally would be the best form of communication. I understand why people use the group up voice line and ping system as necessary, but this is just the new system. You just have to fire open a wheel and that's just the way it's gonna have to be, unfortunately. The next question is, what is wrong with the competitive system? Went from Masters 2 to Diamond 5. Most of my games were played with Masters. They're rarely Grand Masters. Games felt balanced during the first season. I don't even have to open this. There's nothing inherently wrong with the competitive system. It feels that way simply because the game is new and doesn't have enough data. You're getting players from many, many, many different uh, backgrounds. Some of it from Overwatch 1 from many, many years ago with old account ratings. Some new accounts getting thrown in simply because the matchmaker doesn't have enough data yet. So it kind of assumes that you have a certain rating, a hidden MMR underneath the frontal layer. This person said went from Masters 2 to Diamond. That front facing rank, the Masters Diamond, that's just for show. What's layered underneath your MMR, your matchmaking rating, is your true rating. Now, you may be getting players who are fresh accounts, maybe have won their first three games of ranked ever, and the matchmaker simply doesn't have enough data. So it assumes, hey, maybe it's a smurf. Hey, they won three in a row early on. Let's throw them into a higher and higher match until they start losing consistently because the matchmaker always wants to put you at a 50% win rate. I can understand why it would create mismatch games. For example, I did end up getting a couple of diamond players in you know, a GM1 game. And number one, because there's not enough people playing. And number two, again, not enough data. This is season two and as far as i know the more data and more games each player plays over time it should correct itself but it's going to be a little bit unbearable for season one and two i'm kind of it's kind of weird how this person says the games felt balanced for during the first season because i found the this to be quite the opposite where the first season was all over the place and now that they've uh, slowly started to correct it it's starting to feel a little bit better, especially for me. Perhaps this is this is also 20 days ago. They recently released an article on Blizzard forums. I actually covered it in another video, but you can read that and then you can actually get a little better understanding on how the system is supposed to work. Okay, next question. Called a heal bot as Kiriko. It was definitely true. My teammate told me to just play Mercy if I'm gonna heal bot. Wait, I'm gonna read this one. I'm a support main. My teammate told me to play Mercy if I'm gonna heal bot. Okay, I had 20k heals, barely 2k damage, so I'm aware I was healing too much. I'm not a great damage healer, but I love Kiriko if an enemy Ana is getting uh, great antis. Kiriko is also great to null some enemies. Should I really play Mercy if I'm not getting decent pick slash damage as Kiriko? No. To answer from the top, 20k heals, 2k damage. It's not bad. Uh, the best playstyle right now, even at the highest level, is actually focusing on heals while weaving in your damage or your kunais in between the healing papers. So the most efficient way to heal right now for Kiriko is to pop open five papers, five healing uh, healing Ofudas, and you weave in one kunai or two if you're really good at the timing. I generally suggest you heal five, shoot one kunai, 
Heal five, shoot one kunai. It's 100% efficient. You lose no downtime on optimal healing. If you're really good, you can fire two kunais in between, but the, the timing is a little bit tighter. And now the reason why the healing playstyle works so well is because Kitsune Rush is the best ultimate in the game, or at least one of the best in terms of a win condition. And you build your Kiriko ultimate for that Fox, that Kitsune Rush, and that is your win condition. You build it quicker than the enemy Kiriko, you pop your Kitsune Rush, your team plays on it, and you win the team fight just like that. Now, dealing damage and healing damage equates to the same amount of ultimate charge. If I deal 120 headshot kunai, 120 damage kunai is 120 ultimate charge versus healing all five papers on someone heals 130. You get 130 ult charge for that. It's also a lot easier to heal someone to full than it is to land consistent headshots. Hence why the healing play style, especially we saw in the Overwatch League where Dallas Fuel's fielder just focused on healing the field, build fast foxes was the way to play it. Also, second question, well, second thing, Mercy is not uh, the backup primary healer. And also you don't have to worry about like not being a great damage dealer. Kiriko gets a lot of value by simply surviving, being slippery, wall climb. You also get a ton of value on Protection Suzu, of course, because you can cancel enemy ultimates, enemy antis, all that fun stuff. Now, you don't have to worry so much of being about being a great damage dealer because the best times to look for DPS is again during the healing cycle into a few kunais, but you look for a aggressive DPS shot, a safe way to do it. This is not always a hard and fast rule. Overwatch is a very dynamic game, but if you're down a teammate, like you're in a 4v5, 3v5 because somebody got picked, you there's option A where you back up as four as a team if it makes sense, or the option two is to just randomly go aggressive and see if you can cheese and get a double pick on someone who's not expecting it that's when you can go aggressive and deal damage and then teleport out and yeah that is my thoughts on how to play kiriko i've been playing kiriko so much this season this is the highest i've ever been ranked i've gotten to rank 16 on the north american ladder so far main in kiriko you don't have to trust me to like with everything i say but if there's anything that you, i could feel very confident in spitting knowledge on it is the kiriko play style and what's been working as reinhardt how do you deal with a bastion and a junk run on the enemy team the answer is you don't you switch off reinhardt unfortunately reinhardt's biggest weakness is heroes that you can't close the gap on or you can't reach or things that break your shield. If Junkrat and Bastion are playing from a distance and blasting your shield or they're playing Farah, Echo, you can't do anything. The best thing you can do as Reinhardt is go from cover to cover and then kind of move forward though to give your team some space to operate and hopefully your DPS picks them off. If they're not doing that, they're not utilizing the space you're taking, you're not on the same page, probably switch to a different tank. Are my friends being greedy or should DPS players not peel for supports? This is really contextual. It's nice if a DPS can turn around for a support, but it depends on which enemy is diving your support, what support you're playing, and what the comp is. For example, your DPS player, your Tracer and Sojourn generally doesn't really have to peel so much if you can trade back a kill on the enemy team. So this is why supports are getting like kind of left in the dust or a lot of people are complaining about the survivability. It's tough being a support main because you are always the number one focus. So it really depends. If you have a godlike Sojourn DPS friend who's getting a mercy pocket, if they can kill two back for the enemy sending resources to kill you as a support, by all means, that's worth it. This is the reason why Kiriko, Lucio, and Mercy are the top three picks, at least in the high elos, because Kiriko is super slippery, has Suzu, TPs, wall climbs to survive, so nobody has to peel for you. And same with Mercy. Mercy can fly around with the Sojourn and res to solve some of the people who get, solve the problem with some people getting picked. And Lucio, as another example, is because Lucio is really slippery at the high levels. They have really good mechanics there. They can wall ride and survive really, really well. How do you use Ramatra as an anti-flight hero? He was marketed as an answer for flying heroes, but he feels useless in that regard. The answer is you don't. The anti-air pull down mechanic is rarely used for that reason. It's mostly now used to slow enemies down for you to get a little closer for your nemesis form to punch him down. Uh, don't worry so much about trying to consistently pull down Echo Farah. It's not worth it. It's all out of range. Use it when you're up close to slow them. Keep them within your annihilation. You also get movement speed now while you're in Nemesis, so it's not even as necessary. Find ways to use it as a slow. That's the bottom line. Why is Lucio considered one of the best supports currently? Reasons I answered earlier, but Lucio is really s high survivability, and the speed engage is really, really OP and powerful in coordinated environments. I actually don't think Lucio is considered the best at all in the metal ranks and below, because 
people aren't using speed or utilizing the engage and disengage correctly. We're actually seeing less Lucio this season at the high elos because the heroes have slowed down a bit. Or we no longer need like Lucio Kiriko dive with Doomfist or Winston or anything. You can play Ramatra, you can play a bit slower, and then he can go in with Nemesis without speed now. You can play Arissa, who kind of just anchors points, sits there. She can speed up with her spin and get into range as needed. And you see a lot of Kiriko Mercy for that reason. You don't need the Lucio, so you play Mercy and pocket the Sojourn. Or lately, I've been seeing Kiriko Ana a lot in high elos because they can uh, use the Ana to help deal with the Roadhogs that are running around. So yeah, you don't need, I don't think Lucio is considered one of the best at this current moment. He's mostly a product of the meta. If matchmaking is based on MMR and every season we see a rank decay, then what is stopping everyone from being bronze after several seasons go by? I think there's a soft decay on the front. I, it, as far as I know, your MMR does stay the same, although there might be something uh, there might be a factor or variable in for someone who has been inactive for a certain amount of time, I think six months or one year, don't quote me on this, I actually have no idea, that after a certain period of time, it will decay your actual rank a little bit. The whole rank decay at the beginning of the season is to incentivize people to play and have progress and make progression a bit more and give people the dopamine hit that even if they go five and seven for the rank update, they can still rank up. How to know if you're playing well as Zenyatta? Well, uh, don't look too much about the stats. But as long as you survive on Zen for as long as you can, you're not getting dove and killed every single fight, you're probably doing a decent enough job. If you're surviving and you're keeping a Harmony Orb and a Discord Orb on their tank or, or somebody the whole time, even if you miss a couple of shots, that's okay. You're probably doing just fine because your ultimate is great and a permanent discord on a person is a really big deterrent for them from taking space. If there's a discord on a Roadhog, he's going to try to run away for a little bit and break it before he like re-engages or gets in an angle. Discord is incredibly powerful. The only reason why Zen wasn't as popular in the high elo is because Doomfist, Tracer, Sombra in season one, Genji were all running around and that makes Zen's life a nightmare. But with the meta slowing down, I've seen a lot more Zens lately as well. And when I say slow down, I mean Arissa, Ramatra, Sigma, Roadhog. They all play like distance. They're not Doomfist. You know, they're not Winston. They can't, they're not Ball and they can't jump you in the back. Did comp go extremely downhill in season two for anyone else? I think this is mostly just like somebody looking for validation or maybe it is called confirmation bias. I get all these psychological terms mixed up. But for some people saying like, I mean, I'm sure if there, it is generally agreed on or the sentiment is everywhere where they think comp is extremely downhill, people will tend to agree when they feel like it's true. An overwhelming majority might mean it's true, but like there's always gonna be upset people or people feeling like things are shit. My Twitter feed is full of people complaining, but it's just the people who don't complain don't say, I love matchmaking, like it's fine. For me, I think matchmaking has been fine. Wouldn't say fantastic, but I understand uh, you know, the rating I'm at and the pool of players that can potentially be pulled. I'm working hard to, to, to carry and climb each game. So I'm enjoying season two, but just because I'm enjoying doesn't mean this person's feelings about season two isn't valid, but this is always 50 50. But the people who are not having a good time are generally going to make posts like this versus people who are really enjoying it. Why don't more DPS invest in learning Tracer? Your GM too. Yeah, Tracer is really good. Tracer is just a hard hero to play. I wish people would invest more time. I don't really know what the answer to this is. It's just a high learning curve. 150 HP is not a lot for uh, metal rank players. I think they would benefit from learning her, but they could also learn other heroes and learn more game sense and tactics to the game and then translate that into Tracer so they could just focus on mechanics more so than the other parts of the game that they're severely lacking in. Is pinging when you die some big secret? No. So there's a lot of tricks with the ping system. I will be doing a full ping system breakdown, all the hidden features, but you can ping someone for about three seconds before your kill cam comes up as soon as you die to ping their location. Really useful if it's a widow. You should also be pinging when you're doing stuff where you can't actually fight. For example, if you're Reinhardt holding shield, just ping the shit out of all your targets. And if you're Zenyatta using Transcendence, ping people. If you're Mercy flying around with a beam on, ping something. Uh, it helps. All that kind of information is very, very useful. Another tip about the ping. Again, I'll break down the ping system for you in another video. If you're an Endese Doomfist player and you keep spamming voice lines, the voice line counts as a ping. So the game can only register one communication line in the world per player so it doesn't clutter and get annoying. So if I ping something, a target, and I spam, and they say as Doomfist, it'll overwrite that ping and it'll disappear. 
because the end they say is now your communication to the world. So less voice line spam, more pings. Got it? I can't find opportunities to damage boost his mercy. Still in the low ranks, vast majority of time on mercy. It's mostly finding the time where you know the break points are coming. I actually watched a little bit of a silver mercy the other day when I was reviewing my Ana, my silver Ana viewer, because I do VOD reviews every Friday, and there was a mercy in the game. And I could tell they weren't really familiar, could, didn't know when to damage boost. Easy ways to remember, if there's any sort of burst damage that needs to come out, you can flick to it. You can damage, if you need to heal your Sojourn, sure, but when you know she's high charge, you should look for the damage boost, flip to damage, wait for the shot. If your Ash throws out a dynamite and you see it and you're on healing, flick to damage right before she detonates it. Your Rhine is charging and you're in range and you're healing him, flick to damage right before he collides on the wall. Any sort of burst damage, think about flicking your damage, uh, your healing to damage boost in that brief moment. Is it worth it to heal them 20 HP or flip to the damage for the burst? The answer is the burst damage because you can acquire or convert a kill versus them just healing an extra 20 HP. Okay, those are all the top questions. Let me rapid fire some of the new questions that I saw. And uh, that's it for this month. Let's see here. Why can't I rank up or rank down? Uh, you just gotta play more, win more, and you will climb. How do I know when I'm ready for comp? You don't, you just queue up. The game will eventually put you in a match where it thinks your skill level is. If you're bronze, you're bronze, that's okay. Comp is a great way to even the playing field and actually improve. When you're just a quick play warrior, the best thing you can focus on is probably mechanics. And I guess learning the game in general early on, but because quick play pulls people from many, many different skill levels, there is a hidden MMR, but like it will pull in like random groups of friends of three and four, which have varying skill ratings. That's a bit tough to really hone your skills on. Just queue up for comp. Don't worry so much about it. How to reduce instant deaths as tracer. So this is kind of tied to the other person. It's really just mastering the movement, learning to strafe and manipulate your hitbox. AD, AD, left, right, left, right, strafing on tracer is OP. Same with crouching, manipulating your tiny hitbox because you have such a small HP pool, blinking from cover to cover. Blinking once uh, behind them or away from a person who's not in their direct 180 degree field of vision, forcing a person to turn around and then you blink as soon as they do that is a really effective tool that a lot of tracers do to minimize deaths because the less there's less damage coming into you. If you blink, unleash some bullets and you see them respond to your movement, then you blink again. So that's what some tracers do. They'll blink in, and they'll blink backwards, back out, and they'll make people turn around a lot of times. Ranking up in open queue. Is there a strategy in open queue? Yes. Three tanks, two supports is probably the best. Open queue is uh, no limits, right? You can have any sort of hero. Tanks were giga buffed in Overwatch 2 to compensate for them only being one of them in roll lock, or roll queue, excuse me. So open queue, tanks have way more HP and way more damage than they ever did in Overwatch 1. Might as well play all three of them. Zarya in Overwatch 1 had bubble for herself and a teammate at 400 HP. She's 475 HP with two bubbles on a charge. Your Rhine has so much extra HP, so is your Sigma. Just run three tanks, two supports. Uh, did they change projectile? behavior in overwatch 2 no not really there's orissa counter diva not necessarily diva can ha does have shotguns up close uh make sure that if you're ever up close to her make sure you either have fortify or you have your front facing layer of armor on your hp because that mitigates a ton of her bullet damage and you just make some space push her away use natural cover if you keep spamming her in the head as orissa like spamming the diva's face she's gonna be forced to hold matrix up and as soon as that matrix is up as soon as you see it go down, spear her away to create some distance. Distance is always what's going to minimize the damage from Trace uh, Diva to you. But from you to Diva, you should be doing full damage at that distance. Sense level, whatever is most comfortable for the mouse based on the mouse pad space that you have. I personally like pivoting my elbow and my wrist, so I keep my elbow on this chair with my wrist neutral like this, and I use my 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 mouse like this with micro adjustments with the wrist, with big movements with my arm or a pivot on my elbow. Find a sensitivity that allows you to at least do a 180 degree turn. You don't need to do a full 360, right? Cause you just end up in the same spot. But as long as you can do 180 in one direction, 180 in the other, by just swinging the mouse in one direction and the other, that should be fine. How important is it to learn other heroes? I would support main mercy is my strongest by Lance. I can completely swap the Lucio or Kiriko to be my more. I don't even need to say this. I can't use the other ones. Four heroes in a single role is fantastic. Um, a lot of people are one tricks in this game, believe it or not. And they're still able to get into top 500. If you're really good on a hero, you'll find ways to make it work. That said, I'm not encouraging one tricking, but I encourage maining or maining a role 
For me, I'm a support main, so I main a ton of Ana, Bap, Zen, Kiriko, and I can sort of play the other ones, but I do have a preferred four, which is already a lot for some people. A lot of players can't even play other, anything other than one. So the fact that you could play three or four is fantastic. But being a bit flexible is quite nice. However, the argument is, are you flexible enough to keep all your heroes in your hero pool around the same skill level? You might have to put in some work on heroes that you're not as good at, but you really enjoy in order to make sure they're all roughly the same. For me, I'd say my Ana, Bap, Zen, and Kiriko are all around the same level, which is why I can comfortably main them, but it is not that important. Okay, and that's it for Overwatch University questions. Hopefully next month's questions are great as well. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. See you later.